political and strategic uh, initiatives uh, launched by the Commission in the European arena. Today we are going to talk about the, the dual use research perspectives. You know that this is a very important topic because of the uh, consultation ongoing, but also because of the impact that the decisions that Europe will take on the way to embed the dual use in the uh, future framework program will have an influence and an impact on the distribution of funds, on the way we are going to do our approach to research. And today, I think that uh, with the help of uh, Marie Cristina, we can somehow also challenge her to take the crystal ball and uh, understand, uh, try to understand what will mean for us as r and stakeholder. Before starting and before giving the word to our guest, I would like to remind you that uh, in line with every one hour in Europe, we are very happy to open the floor for question and answer after the presentation of Maria Cristina. So to reserve your right to intervene, you just have to write your name in the Q&A cell that you have under your uh, screen. Just write your name and I will give the word, uh, the word to you. We will uh, allow you to open your microphone and camera so that you can directly speak with Maria Cristina and challenge uh, her. Given that, Maria Cristina, welcome. I feel challenged. Uh, you are challenged, of course, because I mean, that's, uh, that's the scope of the one with Europe. And uh, we are really keen to hear more details about the white paper, the package, the consultation. What is the Commission preparing for us? Thank you very much, uh, Massimo. First of all, let me say that it is always a pleasure for me to be with you in uh, all the initiatives that uh, you are uh, undertaking as director of the NTNU office in Brussels. And, um, and also, I'm very pleased to be with all of you trying to give you some um, some uh, the main elements uh, of the European Commission's action uh, on economic security strategy and also of this uh, white paper on uh, dual use research. Uh, indeed, uh, as you said, Massimo, this is uh, one of the topics uh, which is very uh, important uh, in the agenda here in Brussels, but not only in Brussels, I mean, uh, in, in the EU and in, uh, in the world. Because at the end, what is economic security? What are we talking about? I think it's important that we frame the discussion. And uh, as you said, which are the implications for research and innovation? Uh, we, we should start from the assumption that uh, through research and innovation in Europe, we want to be as open as possible. We want to cooperate with our main partners in order to do what? In order to do two things. First of all, in order to put our scientists together to tackle the global societal challenges. And also, I do believe that uh, research and innovation can be an important mean in order to really give some concrete elements to the relations with our strategic partners at international level. Of course, we have seen in the recent years that the geopolitical changes have made of research and innovation a key element of the geopolitical scenario that we have now. I don't have to mention uh, China, Xi Jinping, what uh, has been done in terms of research and innovation, the position that this policy has taken um, in, the, in the Chinese policy, the Chinese approach, and uh, many other, uh, other uh, ex examples I could give of uh, our international partners uh, with whom we have a less complicated relation than China. Really, science and technology are at the key of our engagement. I was uh, not later than this morning uh, with the commissioner from the African Union on Education and Science, and he was really commending also there the work that we have done together in order to use research and innovation cooperation as a building block of the EU-Europe uh, partnership. Now, of course, uh, um, we want to be open, we want to cooperate, but of course, we need to look at the European interest. We need to do to look at the European interests. We need to look at our strategic autonomy, and also we need to promote our competitiveness, which is, at the end is what the treaty uh, asks us. Uh, the European treaty asks us to do, and uh, this is something that uh, in the field of research and innovation we had clear in our mind since uh, already some years, because uh, already in 2021 we have adopted a clear strategy on research and innovation, the global approach. Uh, which in fact uh, uh, embeds this uh, 
this uh, this endeavors to be to be open to cooperation to be as open as possible but as close as necessary when it is needed and this is also reflected in horizon europe which as you all know i guess it is the uh, our uh, framework program for uh, channeling the research and innovation uh, budget uh, that we have the possibility to be as open as possible not only to the associated countries but to to the researchers coming from uh, uh, basically any basically without basically from any country from outside the EU but we have also put in the program some safeguards that allow us to restrict cooperation where it is necessary in order to safeguard our strategic interest and uh, um, our uh, um, our main uh, competitiveness preoccupation and this is a bit of what has led the European Commission in a more general way to the adoption of the economic security strategy um, as uh, we do in Brussels, when we want to launch a policy to describe and define a policy, we do it through a communication. So there is a, a communication that was adopted uh, in uh, June last year, which in fact uh, um, is based on three main pillars. First of all, the aim of the strategy is to promote the European Union's competitiveness and growth. So the first pillar is promoting. The second one is protecting protecting the European Union economic security. And the third one is partnering, partnering with uh, worldwide, with our uh, strategic partners in with whom we share the same values and principles in order to work together to promote these, uh, um, these uh, uh, endeavors for uh, achieving a greater growth and, uh, and competitiveness. And uh, that is a bit the basis uh, of the of the paper on the on the dual use, because in fact uh, if we have been working since uh, June last year in the Commission to implement the economic security strategy communication. I will not uh, uh, go into the different initiatives, but for example, let me recall that in October 2023 last year we adopted a recommendation identifying 10 technology areas which are considered as critical for the European Union's economic security. And uh, we are working with the member states in order to have a risk assessment of uh, those technologies and see how we can bring forward in terms of uh, collective behavior in uh, dealing with uh, those technologies. And uh, in, in the framework of the uh, different uh, actions which have been taken in, for implementing the economic security strategy, we have uh, uh, presented as commission a, a package in January this year with uh, five specific initiatives, uh, out of which three are in the area of trade, uh, which uh, relate uh, basically to foreign, inter uh, foreign investments, and two relate to research and innovation. I will start from the first one, which is not the one we discussed today, just to mention that one important initiative that we have um, adopted is the, is the proposal for a council recommendation on enhancing research security, uh, which, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is again very important because it lays the foundation for a greater coordination of member states and greater guidance to the research funding organizations and universities while respecting the uh, institutional and academic autonomy of the universities in order to, to, to engage with the, with the due diligence and the needed responsible knowledge uh, with uh, uh, partners from third countries. This is, uh, this is a, a legal text which we have proposed and is being discussed in, in the Council and uh, hopefully will be adopted uh, by, the, by, the, by the Council on the 23rd of uh, May. And then, of course, uh, the Commission, together with the Member States, uh, will steer the implementation. Let me add also, since uh, I spoke of the geopolitical context, that uh, the, the reserve security is one of the key elements of the, uh, which will be dealt with in the context of the G7. Uh, the G7 uh, ministerial meeting uh, on research innovation, which uh, I will take place uh, in, a, in, a, in a city which I think is very dear to your heart. It will be it will take place in Bologna on the 9th and the 11th of July, and it will discuss uh, economic security and research security. Now, let me turn to the other initiative that the Commission adopted, uh, launched 
on the 24th of, um, of um, January, which is what brings me here, which is a white paper on options for research and development support involving technologies with dual use potential. This white paper launches a public consultation of public authorities, civil society, industry, academia, and all stakeholders in order to really see what can be done in order to promote the, the research and innovation for those technologies with the dual use potential. Why this is important in the framework of the economic security strategy? Because this is a, a super important uh, to do that in order to promote the competitiveness of the European Union in a sector which is uh, certainly a very, a very delicate uh, one. Um, in fact, uh, many of the technologies that uh, are critical for the European Union economic uh, uh, security are related to have a dual use potential. They are relevant for many fields, both in civil and in defense domains. And if we need to maintain and grow our competitive edge on these critical technologies, we need also to strengthen the research in this field. Um, I will not go into details, and I'm very pleased to be here with my colleague, who's my advisor, Marco Grancagnolo, who can step in afterwards, and he was one of the um, drafters, um, if I wouldn't say the drafter, of this uh, white paper, and he will be able to, to give more, more details if needed. But I, what I would like to highlight is that it is uh, well known that the results of projects could develop technologies with the dual use potential immediately or at a later stage. And uh, um, it's important that uh, we can pull it up the potential that stem from these technologies, which originally are intended only for purely or for purely for civil or defense application. So it's a question of having greater impact on what we do, greater impact on what, on what we, we finance, again, in order to uh, increase the competitiveness of the EU and also move forward in the sector of defense, which is a very important one. Let me say that today in Brussels, uh, there is the European Council, as you all know, and one of the areas which will be discussed is how to enhance the European defense capabilities. There are proposals on the table. So it's really at the core of the agenda. Also, you know, how we use research and innovation to do so. Now, let me just say before, um, before uh, digging into what the white paper puts forward as question, that uh, currently in the current legislative framework, there is a strict separation in funding for civil and defense research and development activities. What exists now is that we have the Horizon Europe uh, program, which can finance projects that have an exclusive, and I underline exclusive, focus on civil applications. And then there is, on the other side, the European Defense Fund that can finance projects that have an exclusive, and again, I underline exclusive, focus on defense application. So there is no cross-cutting, uh, there is no uh, cross-fertilization among these two programs. And uh, there is, as I also mentioned, that results in a, in, in a lack of, um, of, uh, of, of, of possibly, explore, um, possibly exploit the results of the civil and uh, the, um, the defense research for increasing our competitiveness and our potential in the field of uh, of, uh, of uh, related to dual use. I would like to add also that uh, there is not uh, a, at present a common definition of dual use, which is also an additional complication that uh, hampers the opportunities, for example, for joint investments with other partners, such as with the European Investment Bank. I would like to say just something before again, presenting uh, the, the questions of the white paper, that uh, this is not a new debate. I mean, we have not, uh, although now it's very important, it's really on the political agenda. I, I, I mentioned, I mean, uh, and uh, how, how in this geopolitical context this has a bigger relevance, but this debate on the possibility of funding also um, research 
uh, with the dual use application already took place in the phase of uh, um, preparation of the current Horizon Europe program. Indeed, uh, for those of you that uh, have followed uh, what is happening in Brussels, I'm sure Massimo, you do it uh, very well and you remember when the Commission, when the European Commission presented its proposal for the Horizon Europe regulation, there was also the, the possibility uh, to, to support um, to support uh, the, um, the dual use. There was not a, an exclusive focus on civil application. There was also the possibility to not uh, to to have um, a focus on defense application, since the proposal was not limited with a clear focus on civil application. The issue is very political. It's very controversial also in the European Parliament and during the negotiations which led to the adoption of the Horizon Europe regulation. This possibility of, uh, uh, of focusing not exclusively a civil application, so being open also to other applications, has dropped. And now, I mean, the program, as I mentioned earlier on, is based on the fact that we can focus exclusively, so only research for civil applications. So that's just to say that uh, the debate already took place, but of course, now the situation is different. So in line also with, the, with, with, with this political situation, in line also with the attention and the importance that our president, Mrs. van der Leyen, gives to also promote defense. And uh, she had made a very, very important speech at the end of last year in which she clearly said that she wanted to, you know, to promote the use of research with dual use potential. We have the commission as adopted on the 24th of January, this white paper, which identifies three possible options for the future. No need to say that the procedure for adoption was quite, uh, was quite complex. It was very interesting for us to work on that and to really find a very consensual way uh, to present these, uh, these options on a super uh, sensitive political issue. The first option of the white paper is in fact to go further based on the current setup. So basically under this option, the mutual exclusive focus on civil or defense application could remain. So there would be the, the, the differentiation as it stands now. Incremental improvements would be introduced through a streamlined approach to seek for synergies and cross fertilization. So this is the only approach which is feasible now in the current uh, uh, MFF with the current programs because in fact it's based on saying the setup remains, but uh, we will work more together at the services level in order to have a cross fertilization synergies, uh, uh, prepare the proposals in a in a in a way that uh, we can uh, we can tackle the issues which are which are which are uh, mutually relevant. But basically, we don't change the situation, and that is the first option. The second option is to remove the exclusive focus on civil application in selected parts, and I underline selected here, of the successor program to Horizon Europe. So that would mean that only for some uh, selective, selected parts of this, uh, of the successor of Horizon Union, uh, Horizon Europe, sorry, um, there, uh, the exclusive focus on civil application could be replaced simply with a focus on civil application. So we would, uh, we would uh, take out the exclusivity from a part of uh, the Horizon Europe program, and that uh, would allow to support strategic emerging technologies independently of the field of application, be them defense or civil, subject, of course, uh, to specific conditions which will have to be defined. And at the same time, since I said that this exclusive focus would be removed only from specific parts of the program, so at the same time, other parts of the framework program would maintain an exclusive focus on civil application. So that is the second option. And of course, it is for the next MFF, for the next multi-annual financial framework. Then the third option that we have put forward in the, in the white paper in aims at uh, um, at seeing if it would be possible to create a dedicated instrument with a specific focus 
on research and development with dual use potential. So that would be a new instrument that uh, would be devoted to technologies with dual use potential, with its own budget, its own rules of participation, and while the future uh, Horizon Europe, or whatever it will be called, and European Defense uh, uh, Program, whatever it would be called, would remain as they are now, and there would be, if you want, a third program, an additional program, which uh, would focus on research and development with the dual use uh, potential. So these are the three options. And um, as I mentioned, uh, the aim of this uh, white paper is to launch a public consultation because uh, for the European Commission, it's really important that we have the feedback uh, from, the, from the stakeholders on a topic which is uh, such uh, so complex, so politically sensitive from the member states. And uh, the one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here, not only because I'm always happy to be to the anti and you events uh, with you, Massimo, and your colleagues, but also is because uh, we have uh, this consultation which is running uh, until the 30 of April. I repeat, the consultation runs until 30 of April 2024, obviously. And uh, we would like to really encourage all of you to, 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 to submit your opinion, to reply to this consultation, and also to spread as much as possible this uh, white paper so that in the Commission we can have as much as possible uh, views from the different stakeholders, which uh, will allow us to, to be duly informed uh, in order to assess the next steps that uh, will have to be taken. I finish by saying that, uh, of course, uh, we all know that uh, this, co this current commission is reaching the final stage. So, I mean, uh, it, it is uh, clear that uh, what uh, we will uh, uh, receive as a, as a result of the consultation uh, will be analyzed by this commission, by ourselves. And uh, we have not uh, really decided, there is not a decision on the timeline, but it uh, seems very obvious that uh, we will bring it to the next commission, which then uh, will uh, have to take the decision on how to move forward, uh, including within the context of the next MFF. Voila, I hope I've been clear on the main elements. That's and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and say that uh, me, together with my colleague Marco, we are really here to listen to your questions and try to reply as as well as we can do. Thank you, Christina. I think this was a very interesting and uh, enlightening understanding of the situation. For example, I find very interesting uh, the fact that in, for option three, EDF will continue to be there. So there may not be changes uh, in the framework, but just an additional budget line, which is something that probably is, has not been completely taken. So that's very interesting. Maybe we can call Marco to join us uh, on, on stage to make this show movement. You know, uh, you see, we are a very dynamic uh, webinar, as you see. Uh, let us know if you need a chair. We can, we can also- I can stand. You can really much fun. You are in good shape and young. So that's, uh, that's I'm, I'm sure you can, you can handle. Uh, while people are already uh, uh, reserving the right to put questions, I would like to remind you that you have to write your name in the Q&A box for me then to handle the traffic and give you the possibility to put the question directly. So please write your name and affiliation if you want, or you can present yourself. I, I would take the privilege of my role of moderator to ask you uh, some clarifications, because of course, answering to a consultation like this uh, without knowing what could be the final scenario is quite complicated. As uh, uh, the potential answer will have an impact on the MF MFF. And if I have to think Norwegian, if I am Italian, you know, I work for Norway. The first, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, let's imagine option three is the chosen one, then we are going to have an extra budget line to which you now we have to decide to associate or not. And probably this will apply to all the other associated countries. So how do you see this uh, um, association inclusiveness in the possible scenario that is given by option three? Because at the end, option two is, uh, if you want the, the the most more easy, because the MFF will have Horizon or the FP10, and so association to FP10 will give you access to the dual use the specific calls, uh, as you explained, Christina. But for option three, this is generating a sort of different scenario. So, how do you perceive the role of associated countries, also considering the fact that uh, even now 
some of the polls are somehow reduced in participation due to political problems and uh, problems, political constraints. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, Massimo, I mean, I think uh, that uh, you gave yourself the answer to your question, <laughs> because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, option three uh, would not be uh, within the context uh, of uh, the success of, of Horizon Europe. So we cannot uh, apply uh, what happens in Horizon Europe. I mean, this is going to be, if, if it is regained, it is going to be a completely different program with its rules, uh, including rules of participation, which will have to be to be defined. So I mean, uh, um, I I I I don't know which they would be. I don't know if this option would ever see the light. But certainly, what I know is that uh, uh, that would be in 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 in, in this continue. It would not just be a repetition of the Horizon New Program or success or its successor. It would be something new that will need to be created. So we cannot just uh, uh, apply. As such, uh, the the rules that exist now for association in a possible option three scenario. Maybe there will be others. Maybe if this scenario will take place, but uh, they will have to be to to be to be defined. And uh, there, I guess, also without prejudging anything, because we don't know if this option will ever see the light. But also that uh, maybe the sensitivity of the question. Uh, also but to confirm that option three is not the revision of the current uh, role playing that there is between Horizon and EDF. So Horizon and EDF in option three will continue to exist. I mean, we and don't... you're going to have a third strand line for the dual use yeah. research. Correct? We don't know what will happen in the, in the next MFF, obviously, mm, because they're yeah. not there. But uh, as it is presented, the situation now, uh, and Marco can add some elements if he wants, uh, certainly, is that uh, there will be in option three, there will be two um, separate programs, one for research, the successor of Horizon, uh, one for EDF, and then there will be something additional, which uh, would be for uh, uh, supporting the dual use, uh, uh, the, the research with dual use potential. But we don't know yet uh, uh, the the way this will be this yeah, will be put in place. Uh, the the question is uh, if uh, uh, in in a possible uh, changing scenario which would be beyond the current state of play, if uh, we have uh, a part of Horizon which is not anymore exclusively focused on civil application, that option two, or a completely different instrument which will add. In a way that will need to be to be to be defined to the other two instruments. I don't know, Marco. Do you want to give some more clarification? I think you provided the the, the, the answers already. So I would just simply possibly say that that nothing is excluded in terms also of what the possible association of the countries will be in, uh, in this scenario. Uh, but of course, this has to be foreseen. Uh, seeing the overall architecture of the next federal uh, we are spec we are crystal ball speculating i know this uh, and i think that also our public is understanding that it's just uh, assumptions because another scenario that come to my mind is for example the fact that uh, we know that we're going to go also to an hectic period uh, regarding the budget no uh, there are pressures on the reserve budget uh, the discussion about the allocation for horizon europe uh, for fp10 sorry uh, there are claims for 200 billion euros, but we are under economic pressure, so I think it will be difficult to arrive to that amount of money. And I'm wondering if at the end this is going to be uh, this, again, talking about option three, is option three is going to drain money for Horizon or is going to add money to Horizon opportunities? You know, that's a, that's a question that I, I know you don't have the answer, but it's a scenario that we have to take into account when we do the choice among the three scenarios. Yeah. But I mean, I, I really think that uh, in, in the situation where we are now in, in the European Union, uh, with this uh, uh, really changed geopolitical landscape, with this uh, increased need uh, to, to, to promote the European competitiveness, uh, and we're all uh, looking forward to, to, to receive uh, and read the report of our compatriot, uh, former Prime Minister Draghi, on the competitiveness of the European Union, uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, give uh, clear, uh, I mean, we cannot uh, assumptions uh, on what the situation will be in the future in terms of the MFF. 
So I, I, I would think that uh, to be very, very radical and rational and uh, not for for nothing, I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, the question here would be to 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 to, to see uh, which which would be the, the, the better option uh, in taking into account the scenario that exists now. And I I I think that uh, considering the implication it will have on a future scenario, it's a bit complex because we don't at this stage have uh, uh, the very clear elements on what would be a future scenario. Indeed, uh, it's no secret that uh, in the European uh, Commission, in the G research, we are uh, working uh, on the preparation of what we now call FP10. Uh, we also have a high level group on the evaluation of Horizon Europe, which is uh, chaired by Professor Heidel, former research minister from Portugal, who is also looking at giving some advice on the on the on the on the future, but I I, I think that uh, it's really too early to 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 guess. I mean the crystal ball it's uh, imaginary here, but I think it's too early to use it for for the future. So I I would think that uh, it's important to 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 for, for us to see if uh, there is really scope in option one to 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 make better use of the existing uh, programs. Uh, in synergies, cross fertilization to promote research with dual use potential. If uh, the consideration of possibly opening uh, part of the uh, future Horizon Europe program to do to not being exclusively focused on civil could be in a way forward, or if there is an appetite for having a different instrument that creates some challenges in aligning, of course, and making the course complementary, I suspect. But yeah. uh, I don't want to monopolize the discussion with, as you know, it's passionate me a lot, as uh, the chat is really boiling, and I really appreciate the interest that uh, you are generating, uh, Christina. I will start with Eric Kissen, uh, which uh, probably you know, because he was a former colleague. Uh, I see he raised a hand, so he's not in the Q&A, but he's just in the... In the yeah, so Eric, uh, uh, be ready because we are promoting you as a panelist, uh, and so you should be able to talk uh, if the system give us uh, the possibility. But I kindly ask you not to raise a hand, but to use the Q and A. So I'm making an exception for Eric. For the rest, write your name there. So Eric, I don't know if you are now. You should be allowed to talk. Allowed to talk, maybe. We are having some technical issues, maybe. Ah, no, he doesn't want to be promoted uh, as a party. So maybe he doesn't want to talk. OK. Uh, let us know, Eric. Write your name in the Q&A then. Then the first who reserved made it after four minutes uh, of the start. So Gyoko Bunevsky, we are going to give you the right to intervene. Gyoko, yeah. Just accept our proposal to intervene. Yeah, I suspect that now you are allowed to open your camera and microphone and please present yourself briefly and uh, make your question. Just open your microphone, Yoko. We don't hear you, you have to unmute you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> a little bit problems by <laughs> uh, by internet. Mm, nothing special. Just to greet you. Uh, there are so many questions uh, after reading and after thinking much more detail. After that, I will have uh, much more questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. So then uh, I would like to uh, ask Andrew Ging Ginger to to uh, intervene. So Andrew, in one second, you're going to be. Allowed. We have just a, a technical time to promote people to panelists. So, yeah, Andrew, you are online. So, please open your camera and intervene. Thank you. Thanks so much, Massimo, and um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm from Northeastern University, originally uh, with its first campus in Boston, but now operating across a, a lot of different countries. Um, the, the white paper is really fascinating and, and 
such an important topic uh, right now for the EU and, and geopolitically. Um, I, I'm interested in um, the kind of interaction between two parts of, of what you were talking about. Uh, one of them is um, the kind of necessarily gray nature of, of dual use, as it were, that uh, increasingly as well with, with different kinds of technology, determining whether something is actually dual use or not is quite difficult. Um, and that problem of definition is likely to occur across most of the options. And, and I'm interested, in, I suppose, from my own perspective, um, but also from, from other sort of comments I've seen um, about uh, how that might play out for foreign owned entities within Europe and indeed third parties who, who may be friendly and may be very good cooperators and collaborators on dual use, uh, but will need to determine whether they're likely to be excluded or included, um, and at what stage of the process you think a judgment will come down on um, this is dual use or, or is not. I suppose I'm thinking that the longer it takes to get an opinion, you know, if it comes at the end of the assessment process, that's more of a deterrent than if it's clearer up front whether or something's going to get counted as dual use. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I will pass it uh, to Marco, that is the expert there, to give you some... Thank you, Christina. This is uh, an honor. And thank you very much, uh, Andrew, uh, for, for these uh, two actually very important questions. First of all, the definition of dual use. Uh, the white paper itself uh, does not make a definition, does not give a definition of dual use, because it acknowledged that this is a difficult uh, task. Uh, and, and indeed, it actually presents a question to the public to suggest the building blocks of what the possible definition of dual use uh, could be. Uh, what is uh, uh, the understanding here is that what makes a technology dual use is actually the application of it. So in the moment that it's used, it defines whether this is for civil or defense uh, applications. Uh, while we know also that when the PRL, so the technology readiness level is low, this is most of the time application agnostic. So meaning that the application is not known of the, of the technology itself. So the real issue starts for relatively higher PRL when possibly it is much more clear whether where the, 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 the line can be drawn. Um, on the second question related to the um, uh, what I understand it would be the eligibility conditions that would allow participants to uh, engage in uh, a project that could eventually have uh, dual use uh, applications. Uh, the logic, in my view, but this is of course still like uh, uh, in the making, uh, also thanks to the feedback that we will receive from the stakeholders, uh, would be that indeed that it, there would be eligibility conditions from the start so that the applicants would already know what uh, calls would eventually be considered as uh, to, for dual use applications, and then the, the eligibility conditions would be clear from the beginning, so to uh, avoid situations that, uh, for instance, there would be uh, applicants being excluded afterwards, after they have presented their projects, which would be, of course, not in no one interest, really. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your question. Uh, we have a question from Luis Farina Busto, which I think has been already answered. Uh, it's uh, yes, it is separated from, from yeah. that's uh, that's I think we have answered. And then I have David Peck from TU Delft. David, uh, give us one second, and we upgrade you to panelist. Uh, okay, you should be receiving our request to intervene. Just accept it, and you should appear online. Here you are. Open your camera. Present yourself. Hello, uh, Dave Peck from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, thank you. Very, very clear presentation. We see the Critical Raw Material Act uh, coming into force in the coming weeks. And a defence is a key part of the motivation and strategic autonomy for that as well. Uh, when you were explaining uh, what's going on, uh, you talked about strategic emerging technologies, and I understand what you mean by this. But of course, critical materials are cross-cutting. So is there within the scope of what you're looking at for dual use and defense a role 
for critical materials within those programs, whichever options you go for? Challenging question. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is challenging, especially because uh, we already said that we don't have a definition of, of, dual, of dual use. So, of course, uh, critical materials is one of those critical areas that uh, could, uh, could lead uh, to research with dual use potential. And uh, for the moment, uh, we are working in Horizon Europe uh, for supporting those projects, which, as uh, I have highlighted, have an exclusively for exclusive focus on civil use, and, uh, um, and so that what we will continue to do uh, for the critical materials uh, uh, too, and uh, of course, uh, there, if there would be a change allowing the possibility in future program also to defend to 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 support um, projects that have uh, a possible uh, dual uh, use. Uh, implication, uh, then we would have a larger way of also considering projects that uh, include uh, the, the, critical, uh, the, the critical materials. We have, uh, I think that uh, th there is, uh, there is uh, also, um, th th there is also a, a link, uh, a very important link uh, with what you said, uh, with uh, the uh, communication, the recommendation that the Commission adopted uh, on the 3rd of October that I mentioned earlier on, uh, in which it identifies 10 technologies areas as critical for the European Union's economic, uh, economic uh, security. And, um, and, and there, um, there we, we do have, uh, of course, uh, still the possibility uh, to, to make a link with uh, those areas and uh, the, the the possible projects with dual use implication that which we have not done it in the white paper. Now, critical material is part of these uh, advanced, eh? advanced, materials. advanced materials. Is uh, advanced materials uh, is, is is part of these uh, ten uh, critical uh, areas that the Commission has highlighted. But uh, what I would like to say because that was discussed also in the phase of preparation of the white paper that for the moment, although we say that there is conceptually a link, but we would not um, we leave, uh, we, 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 we come with the definition of dual use, which remains open and which does not remain uh, stuck to these, uh, to these 10 uh, uh, critical areas amongst which we have advanced materials. So it's, it's all in the making, of course, uh, uh, the area you're working in is very much uh, uh, linked and affected uh, with research with dual use potential. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Sandra's uh, question has been already answered in our initial discussion, so we still do not know if uh, Defense R&D is going to be funded or not at the expense of other research areas in F510, uh, so that's uh, absolutely unknown in our crystal ball, if I understood correctly your answer, Christina. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you want to take the anonymous attendee saying, how do you think option two could impact FP10? I mean, it's... Uh... I mean, this is a question that uh, I can take, uh, certainly, but uh, what, what, uh, what we would like to say, especially from, from our side, I mean, uh, being... Uh, in the management of DG Research Innovation and the firm believer of the role of research uh, and innovation uh, for the European Union and also for a, a greater impact of the EU in the world, is that uh, we will do all what is possible to, uh, to avoid that any possible uh, um, addition, additional instrument on, uh, on, uh, on dual use, on promoting research with dual use potential would uh, take away attention, importance, and ultimately funds from uh, the other areas of research. This is certainly the reply that uh, I can give at this, at this stage. Now, as I mentioned here, we will uh, we will have to see the overall economy, and the economy, it's, it's a good word in this case, uh, since we have budgetary constraints, but I said the, over, the, the overall economy of the next MFF, and hoping that uh, a balance will be found amongst the different actions. And on, on our side, what we can say is that we are all fully mobilized to um, lay the foundation for uh, uh, research programs uh, as they, in a, research in a classical way, will be as important, even more important than what they are now. 
Thank you for reassuring us about the fact that you are a sort of gatekeeper to, to safeguard the possible budget for research. We know that you also depend on political decision, but at least we know that you are also very influential and potentially try to convince them in this direction. I would uh, very likely open the camera for Edith uh, Ertok, uh, also an old, an old friend. Sorry, this shouldn't happen. Edith, uh, you are asked to intervene. Yeah, please Edith. Open your camera and microphone. Yes. You can see me or you can hear. Can you hear me? Hear you is a little bit black, but we hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I have the video on, so I do not know why it's that. Uh, thanks very much uh, uh, for the very, uh, very timely and the very uh, informative uh, presentation. And I think that it's also a very good idea that we call the participants uh, or the potential beneficiaries uh, uh, to, to, to share their opinion. Yeah, it's a it's a rather clear that we wish to keep the budget for research, and therefore I think that it's a different it's a different issue if we have to calculate from the current or bilaterally increased budget for the Horizon Europe, or we will have a major change as the European Parliament as, and we have more space to accommodate accommodate different budgets. So my question is the following: I think it's critical that we have a dual use definition, and my question is that how this dual use definition will be done together maybe in consent with the G7, so maybe it will be done in Bologna or, or how it will be. I think that it's, uh, uh, or we do it with the, with just with the budget line. Uh, that's definitely definitely a question. Who will manage the funds? If it's a, if it's a different fund, different scenario, the third scenario, uh, then very, very it will belong. Will it remain under DGRTD or will it move? Will it move? And maybe the, the, the last question, because I represent Jeanne, and the Geant is, the, as you know, the multi-speed network to connect the European countries and the 110 countries. But we have a very preferential treatment under the WTO rules because we are exclusively civilian. So immediately, if we would have a dual use or we would have a military or defense use, uh, we would very likely uh, lose our beneficiary status and exception from the WTO rules. So there are some specificities maybe to check uh, within and after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Uh, so three questions. Yes, I'm not sure I got all of them, especially the last one. Uh, if I can recall, really the, yeah, the first one is uh, when the dual use you expect to be formulated, also maybe after the consultation and collecting inputs, uh, the gatekeeper for the money, if uh, the budget uh, located for this special line is going to stay in DGRD or you expect different approaches, and uh, uh, the role of, uh, uh, if I understood correctly, Edith, uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, the interconnection, because Edith worked for Jean. Yeah. And so somehow it can be a network also used for military use. So somehow, yeah, so. And, and the network has a very preferential status under the WTO rule because we are exclusively civilian. Yeah, so if the... If it because, sorry, the sorry network, Edith, but... Sorry, Ed, the hear. sound is not very good. So if you can just uh, speak slowly, maybe we can understand uh, what you mean. I try. So Jeant has a very preferential treatment un and exception under the WTO rules because we, ser we serve civilian research sector. And we would immediately lose our beneficiary status under the WTO. And would it would cost us, it, it would cost us much. Okay, so is the is the problem of losing the status yeah. of Jean no. and um, WTO? Yeah, I will say a couple of words and then pass it over to Marco. I mean, uh, uh, on the question of the definition of the dual the dual use, this is uh, in fact also what we have uh, included in the consultation uh, to give elements for a possible definition of dual use. So we are not uh, doing this definition now, uh, although some work is ongoing, and Marco will say will say a word on that. On the question of the of the who is gonna handle possibly this uh, third option if uh, it ever see the light, we don't know yet. As I told you, we don't we, we don't know yet. We know it would be a separate. Uh, it could be not would be a separate uh, uh, instrument. Uh, so it is not uh, it's not known yet. 
And again, let me recall once again that uh, uh, we are uh, phasing out from this commission, so there would be a new commission uh, uh, with uh, new than uh, MFF, uh, new from uh, as a former MEP knows uh, know very well how much things can change. So we we cannot uh, really know at this stage. But maybe Marco, you can complement uh, both on the work uh, with the EIB on the exactly. definition and on the last uh, question that uh, you have put uh, related to Jean. Marco. Uh, indeed, no. I uh, wanted to build on this uh, indeed because the work on the definition impl 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 implicates uh, involves. I think it's the right word. Uh, the especially the European Investment Bank uh, because uh, the European Investment Bank has its own definition of dual use, which is not uh, compatible. Uh, it, it did not help in. Uh, promoting dual use uh, joint investment between the EU and the EAB. Um, and this actually is a, a call that it's not new as well. It's been repeatedly stated that the EAB should make an effort to uh, modify its own definition of, the, uh, of dual use. And this is actually uh, uh, in, in the making uh, since the election of the new EAB president, uh, Nadia Calvino. So this is actually one of the uh, important uh, deliverables that she already took on board. So we will have to also work with them and see how this can be, uh, you know, adjust in a way that uh, work uh, both ways. Just simply to say that we do have in European Union a definition of dual use. This is also reported in the white paper itself. And it this in the context of the export control of dual use items. Now, what is the key uh, question mark that we may want to ask ourselves is that this definition is really specific to items, so really uh, um, uh, things that already exist, if I may say so, and that, uh, that we should prevent from exporting to, to, to outside the Union. But when we're talking about dual-use technology, so technology with dual-use potential, we actually don't know yet what the actual technology will be. So we cannot put it on the list as it is currently the case in the export control regulation. So there is a, possibly a way to enlarge a bit the definition in order, in order to include also future uh, uh, technologies that could be uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in this definition. Um, on the Jean question, I, I think it's just important to think from, from uh, uh, my perspective is that anything that is done for dual use should come on, on top of what is already on the table in terms of uh, exclusive focus on uh, civil applications. So the idea is certainly not to exclude any potential applicant to join the program, but actually to be more uh, open to attract newcomers, especially those that may come from the uh, defense industry that at the moment are prevented uh, to a certain extent to participate in a project if the project is intended to be uh, for dual use uh, applications because of the legal base of Horizon Europe that implies that funding can only go for exclusive focus on civil applications. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Edith, for intervening. Uh, I would uh, give the word to a friend and also a colleague of the UniLion Network, uh, Ignazi Salvado from Alianza for Universidades. So, Ignazi, give us one second to find your name in the list. Probably Ignazi, Ignazi left. Oh before being called. It's not anymore connected. So we go to Doris, another good friend from Ireland. Doris, are you still with us? Yes. So there you are. Just accept. Yeah, here you are. Hi, Doris. Good morning. Hi, good good morning, and, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I suppose the question that I had was that whilst there is a big focus on strategic autonomy, there's also a big focus, and there will be during the next MFF, on enlargement. And that will also draw down and have needs and requirements from the EU budget, particularly as we suspect many of those countries would be net recipients. Uh, so we would expect perhaps a larger budget need for cohesion or for agriculture. So what I'm actually, I suppose, in a roundabout way asking is where do, would we anticipate the budget for, for this R&D aspect linked, to, whether it's in option two or option three to come from, uh, without it being at the expense of, of programmes at the moment? So as an example, 
you know, if it were in the, the framework program, might it be in the context of a, you know, public-private partnership? Uh, because I think we're going to have a, a a um a very pressured EU budget, uh, and I know we all would like a two hundred billion budget for FP ten, but um, you know if we have another instrument as an in option three, I'm not quite sure that's going to be a possibility. Thank you. I was discussing with my colleague because uh, Marco, because we already had uh, tried to pass the message on the question of of the budget. Uh, that I mean, uh, again uh, here we are uh, um, we we are discussing on on. Uh, what uh, would be the best way uh, to support uh, research with dual use potential because we think it's important for our competitiveness and uh, this is the, the objective of this uh, of this consultation now the question on uh, uh, where if uh, of course uh, this research uh, will see the light should be funds should be available to support it and the question of where these funds would be taken for, from from which policy they will be taken out. It's a question to which I cannot give a reply now, as I mentioned. I mean, uh, we are uh, currently um, in, in a situation of transition with a new commission that uh, that uh, will uh, be in place. I'm not candidate as president of the commission. <laughs> so, you should. <laughs> so I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we will see we will see when uh, when the things will have been moving forward a bit more on the on the on the selection of, of the president um uh, i mean uh, there is an option on the table that uh, we can maybe understand a bit more where we go other options are on the table we understand less but you know we will have we will have to see uh, which are the priorities uh, that uh, will count for the next commission and, of course, uh, from the member states and the parliament that will then adopt uh, to the budget. I just would say that, uh, uh, you know, like uh, now with uh, today, there is the European Council, there is a lot of traffic in Brussels. And by the way, I was stuck for one hour and a half, but I made it to come here. But there were no tractors, for example. But uh, for the last uh, two European Councils, uh, we had the city here blocked with tractors. Uh, which, uh, which then, uh, not only because there were the tractors in Brussels, but uh, uh, then uh, triggered some choices that were made uh, in in the in the area of the of the common agricultural policy that uh, will have to be taken into account. And maybe last year we didn't have uh, these uh, as uh, so so high. I wouldn't say that it was not important, but so high in the agenda. So I mean, my invitation, so because we are reaching the end of this uh, one hour Europe. Uh, would be to to see this uh, consultation to reply to this consultation and to see it from a from a you know almost from a technical point of view of course there will be political implications but that uh, can be discussed at the later stage thank you i think we have time for a final question uh, before closing uh, um, let's see which one could be Interesting for you to elaborate, uh, Christina, also to not repeat uh, concepts that have been already touched. Uh, can you can you scroll down, uh, Sturla? Let's take this one uh, on uh, why only dual use technologies uh, can improve European competitiveness. Yeah, from, from uh, Jeanette uh, Clonk. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we never say uh, that that is important because it allows me to to possibly clarify any misunderstanding. We never said that only dual use uh, technologies can improve uh, European competitiveness. I mean, there is a huge drive to improve European competitiveness. And uh, I mean, later than, not later than uh, the beginning of this round, the Commission adopted a communication on advanced materials, which is uh, a very important area for enhancing the European competitiveness. So this, uh, this work on the, on, the, on the promotion of technologies which have a dual use potential contributes to improve the European competitiveness together with many other different actions that are being undertaken by the Commission. That's, I think, uh, That's very good. It's uh, 3.01 and uh, normally we committed to end on time, so I'm very sorry for the remaining questions that remain unanswered, uh, but I hope you appreciated the, the discussion. Uh, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Marco, for being with us and uh, accepting to be challenged by the, the participants. You know, this is a very alive arena. Uh, and uh, for the rest, I would like to 
uh, invite you to follow us uh, and uh, wait for the next editions of the Mario Europe. We have already agreed a couple of new speakers and we will announce them soon. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Christine, thanks again for you. your thanks participation. To, thanks to you here. for inviting me, for inviting us, and thanks to all of you online uh, for being connected, being interested, and replying uh, to the consultation. Uh, uh, reply to the consultation. This is the message. Okay, I wish you a nice afternoon and see you at the next edition of One Hour with you. Have a nice day.